Welcome to Leaders Recon, where we will be discussing leadership, warrior skills, and other unique opportunities within the G3 Leader Development Branch. I'm your host, Joshua Carr, and today we will be discussing managing your career with Colonel Leland Blanchard, Chief of Training for the Army National Guard. Colonel Blanchard, welcome to the program. I appreciate you having me. So for those in the audience, sir, who are not familiar with your background, I know you've had a lot of experience both on the active duty side, as an M-Day soldier, as an AGR soldier, both as an enlisted soldier and an officer. Can you give us a little bit of a history of what that looks like? Sure. Uh, so I've, I've actually been interested in the military since I was a uh, very young, young kid. Uh, so my uncles uh, were uh, career, uh, one in the Army, one in the Navy. Uh, so, of course, as you grow up and you visit them, you know, you get to see helicopters and jets and all that stuff. Uh, my dad was in the Navy uh, before I was born. Uh, so, uh, you know, just a, a military background as far as a family, very, uh, very big deal. So as, uh, as I was coming up, uh, as you get into college and you start wondering, OK, uh, all right, I've got a history degree. Uh, what next? Uh, I always wanted to be in the military. Uh, and quite frankly, both of my uh, uncles that I really uh, spent a lot of time with, one was uh, in the Navy, was an enlisted uh, sailor. The other was a warrant officer, a pilot, a Black Hawk pilot in the Army, and had come up as a, as a young NCO. And so they both had talked to me about the importance. If you want to be a good leader, now this was their experience and my experience, if you want to be a good leader, you want to enlist first and kind of get that, that background and have an understanding of what your soldiers are going to go through. So I graduated college, and I think four days later, I found myself uh, at Fort Benning, Georgia. And from there, it just kind of uh, took off. Uh, came up as a young soldier in the 82nd, went to OCS down there at Fort Benning. Uh, then from there, a couple of assignments, Korea as a PL, XO, and then eventually making the transition uh, over to a, a traditional guardsman, and then eventually back as a, uh, as a uh, Title 10 AGR, so back to wearing the uniform full time. What, what, what caused, you know, what was that difference in the transition there? And then what did you do in the meantime on the civilian side as well? So I, and I think this is interesting, uh, at least to me. So I, I kind of came to an inflection point in my career on the active side, right? And so you get to that point, and I think a lot of us face it, where you've got a certain amount of years. And at the time, uh, before 9-11 had happened, uh, you're kind of balancing. So what, what do I want to do if I go much farther than I probably, you know, I'm over the 10 year mark, I might as well just keep on going. Uh, and so I made the decision, Hey, let's go try out the civilian world. Again, a very different, uh, world that we were looking at, uh, back then made the transition actually at the beginning of 2001, uh, went to work for, uh, AT&T again, very different, uh, great place to be. There's a lot of, uh, you know, I learned a lot. But what I think I learned most about myself was being a soldier wasn't what I did. Being a soldier is who I am. And uh, much like my wife predicted, I would not be as happy in the civilian uh, sector, despite the economic uh, impact that it, uh, that it had at the time. Got mobilized, uh, spent, uh, you know, again, very different. That was the days where we might do as much as uh, five, six months pre-mob training and then do your year. Spent, uh, spent a couple years uh, doing that, came back and said, hey, you know what, I, I kind of went over, I talked about that inflection point earlier, went over that mark, and I said, let's, let's just see if there's an opportunity out there. I was blessed. Uh, someone reached out and said, hey, we've got this Title 10 AGR thing. I had no idea what that really was, but they said, hey, you can go back to jumping out of airplanes, uh, go down to JRTC, do some, uh, some interesting work on behalf of the guard. So I jumped in both feet, fast forward a few years a lot of years. And here I am, chief of training. Who would have thought? <laughs> so you've had a really successful career in the military, sir. What are some of the things that really separates high performers or what did you do to separate your career so far? So I think really, uh, in my case, you know, not to suggest that I'm, I'm, I'm a high performer or whatever, uh, I've, I've been very fortunate. I think mentorship early uh, and often throughout my career has certainly made a difference. When I look back now, again, so I, I recognize that I'm blessed. So one of my very first company commanders, in fact, the, uh, the man that, that would send me on to OCS from the 82nd, my company commander is now division commander, Major General uh, Brunson uh, out of 7th ID. 
So mentors like that, my brigade commander at the time, not that I had a lot of contact, but just being able to watch was Lloyd Austin would go on as a young lieutenant. My brigade commander was Dan Bolger, who would go on to be the three, five, seven of the army. Uh, tremendous NCOs, just phenomenal, uh, phenomenal people who offered me a lot of insight. Hmm. Sometimes, uh, not insight that I was always uh, receptive to at yeah. uh, first, but looking back, my goodness, that mentorship from day one uh, through today has just been incredible. And I would tell you, uh, for example, I still uh, go back and forth with General Brunson. Uh, he still is willing to uh, take the time uh, and offer mentorship whenever I need it. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, reached out. So I think that's key. And, and so when we talk, and I know you know the focus being uh, leader development, uh, your podcast, and and looking at career development management, I think that's important. I, I think mentorship uh, really makes the difference, not only as the recipient but as the provider. That, that experience, the, the ability, the things, you know, has a huge impact on, you, on my own career now as a mentor. So I think that's key at every level, but that, that mentorship and providing that when those soldiers arrive, remember when you, when you get a new soldier in, the standard is whatever, the stand, whatever standard he or she sees from day one. So if you have a high standard inside of your organization and a lot of mentorship happening, they will just fall in and believe that's the way the army is supposed to be and they'll take that with them for the next in my case uh 24 25 years speaking of mentorship there a little bit what is your advice to those young soldiers kind of seeking out mentors like who should they be looking for and or what did you do yeah so so i think the the biggest thing is being receptive to mentorship again i, I kind of mentioned uh wasn't always receptive to it because mentorship comes in a lot of forms Sometimes as a young soldier, I was at parade rest or in the front leading rest when I was receiving that mentorship. But, but you, can, you can be receptive of the message. Mm -hmm. I also think that you want to find mentors outside of your day-to-day uh, -day experience, if you will. Okay. So as a young infantryman, some of the best mentors that I've had along the way have certainly been other infantrymen, but they've also been the sustainers, my peers, even my subordinates at times where, where I've taken something and I'm, I, you know, you just, it's very insightful. So you, you want to look, mentorship isn't just, Hey, I'm going to go to my boss. I'm going to get counseled and he's going to explain, you know, this is what your next 20 years looks like. I think it's broader than that. So I think if you're a young soldier looking for that, seek it out from a variety of places. Certainly you want to understand your own experience and your own career path but you also need to understand the other areas around you because those are going to influence and impact your own career uh, as well as you being able to impact other careers along the way. I know this bleeds over a little bit, but you know, let's say you've got a young NCO or officer, what are some of the things that they can do to set themselves up for a successful career? Yeah, so I, I think it all starts with desire. Do something that you're passionate about. You know, and I, I, again, I mentioned uh, the civilian career. I was successful in my civilian career. I just didn't have a passion for it. And so one of the things that I've learned is if you don't have a passion for what you're doing, go do something else. Don't hang around because you're collecting a paycheck. That's a miserable life. And it's just, it's going to lead you down a path that you're, it's, it's going to be a, uh, as they say, a self-licking ice cream cone. You're not very happy. Your performance suffers. Over time, you start to wonder, hey, why am I not moving along, getting the positions or the promotions that I desire? It's, it becomes this cycle uh, that you should avoid. So I, I think at the end of the day, it's find something that you're passionate about and then work hard. I mean, I, I just don't think that what we do is really that complex. At the end of the day, do your job, do the absolute best. Now, I was blessed. My dad told me... Uh, go to work every day and it doesn't matter what you're getting paid it doesn't matter what rank you are if you're capable of producing produce and i know you and i've talked before and, and I've, I've used the uh, analogy of the cup whatever size cup you have and i believe everyone essentially has a cup some are bigger you know some are super big gulps 
and some uh, maybe are a medium uh, size cup. Fill your cup every day because if you do that, the people around you will see that and they will make you successful. People just generally don't want to help somebody who isn't filling their cup every day. So if you do that, your leaders, your subordinates, your peers, they're going to help you out. They certainly have helped me out over my career. My, I know my cup isn't as big as others, but I feel it every day. I, at least I like to think I do. And I think if soldiers do that, you just, you can't help but be successful. Just, you can't help it. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that, sir, one of the things we got f from our social media was someone asking about like, how do I manage the work-life balance there? Um, filling your cup every day um, kind of leads into that. What are your thoughts on that? That's a great question, particularly for our M-Day soldiers, right? So when you think about it, uh, an M-Day soldier, traditional guardsman really has multiple things that you may simultaneously. I know when I was, uh, when I was in the civilian world, I was a company commander. I was uh, working full time. I had a uh, growing family. My wife was pregnant, getting ready to have our uh, son. And I was also full time, in fact, uh, doing, I think, uh, 12 or 15 hours in the MBA program. Mm -hmm. So my, my cup was overflowing uh, with task. And I think a lot of our soldiers find themselves in that, that, same, uh, that same place. So when I talk about filling your cup, you, you got to look at it holistically, right? And so that work-life balance, uh, which, uh, as you well know, I struggle with myself at times. But I think there's a couple things you can do. One, you got to be honest with yourself. You got to be able to prioritize. Some days, and you've heard me say this, my expectation for my soldiers is when there's something important at home, and sometimes that important thing is just picking up your uh, kid at the bus stop and taking them for, for an ice cream cone to have that conversation with your seven-year-old and invest that time with your family. But whatever that priority is, attack that priority uh, with vigor. And then be honest with yourself. There's only so much you can take on. Be honest with those around you and plan. So some days, quite frankly, work is going to be the priority. You know, right now we're, we're in the midst of the coronavirus. When this thing first kicked off on us, I found myself here at 10 o'clock in the evening with a group of soldiers on a Saturday night, making phone calls, trying to make sure that we were tying up uh, loose ends and make sure that soldiers were getting what they needed across the country. That was the priority at that moment. Now I'm also blessed that I've, uh, I've got a great family, my wife, super supportive. But I think part of that has been along the way this is a family, this is, I know, uh, probably catch some grief from social media, but at the end of the day, my family has as much say in, in my career and, and I'm honest about it, upfront about where the priorities are going to be, the path that we walk is as a family. So they're invested as well. I'm honest with them. And then again, I'm honest with my soldiers. Hey, some, some days I need one of my subordinates to pick up uh, a heavy rock and carry it because my plate is full over here. And I think if you, you let people know and they see you prioritizing that work-life balance, everybody can be a little bit more successful. Again, this is, as I, uh, as I often like to say, I tell you what, being in the army is, uh, being in the service is a, is a contact sport. It is also a team sport. No one is going to be successful by themselves. So if you want to get after that work-life balance, I think you have to also, as an organization, support that. So you have to have a climate and a culture that supports. It's okay to sometimes prioritize family. So you've uh, mentioned how it's just impo important to be like the quality of work you're producing, like enjoy and have a passion for what you do. Can you talk about like any of those must have assignments if, you know, for young soldiers that are like, hey, I want to be that sergeant major or I want to, you know, hopefully one day serve as the tag for my state. Right. So at the end of the day, it's about variety. It's about a variety of experiences that 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 you don't want to just be deep. You want to be broad as well. So I'll go back to uh, what I what I talked about earlier with finding mentors from outside of your field. So if you want to be a division sergeant major someday, well, it's not just infantry brigades. It's not just a bunch of 11 Bravos and 11 Charlies that require your leadership, your mentorship, right? So if you don't understand their experience, if you can't at least relate to their experiences, you're going to be challenged. 
And so what I would say as you go along your career path, really find opportunities. Sometimes it's it's different education. Sometimes it may be a two-week broadening opportunity over in the uh, UK. And frankly, as much as we don't like to hear it, sometimes it's about going to a, a division staff or uh, joint force headquarters. You, know, you don't want to hang out there necessarily for five, six, seven years. But you want, if you're just coming up, hey, I, I served in a company as long as I could and then reluctantly I went to battalion and then reluctantly I went to brigade, you're probably, that's probably as far as you're going to go. Uh, so you want to find those opportunities, get the troop leading time, but find out or take the opportunity, just, just get some broadening experience. And kind of talking about broadening experience, is there any specific broadening assignments that, that you would recommend? hard jobs. So, uh, and I mean that, and when I say that I, you look at the things that people are avoiding, they're, they're tough. Uh, maybe they're, uh, not as exciting as, uh, whatever else, uh, might be out there. And then I would, I would ask, you know, what's amazing. If you ask your leaders, what do you think I should do next? Or what's hard or, Hey, what's not getting done? Well, where do you need help? ma'am, where can I help you? You'd be surprised. Now, the danger there is if you ask, you might, you might hear an answer that you don't like. But I think if you can do those things, so take on the hard assignments, go fill the jobs that, that maybe they've got some challenges there. You're doing a couple of things. One, you're broadening yourself, but two, you've now become a valuable resource for leaders who know that when the time comes and there's a challenge, they know who they're going to select and put into that hard position. Now, again, the danger there is over the course of your career, you may find yourself in more than one uh, challenging situation, but don't shy away from that. I Don't shy away from hard challenges. If you do that, you're, again, you're gonna get what you asked for, mm -hmm. but imagine being the, the guy or girl who, who solved some extremely complex challenges when the next complex challenge at the next level comes up you're on a short list so like kind of diving in to that a little bit more like specifically um you know i've had to conversations where people were like hey get into positions where you can manage money or get into positions where you do xyz is there any of those specific things that you've noticed that you're like you know when i'm looking for an officer or a senior nco you know they've done these things in their career kind of can more consistently yeah, so as I as I look at ORBs or ERBs come to me and I start looking to fill a, a position, those are certainly helpful things. But I'm really going to look at performance. I'm going to look at your willingness to take on hard jobs. So I'll give you a great example. So I've got a uh, I've got a major right now that's working for me. Up until he took this particular position, he had never managed directly money. He's now managing almost half a billion dollars uh, daily. Now. A very complex task. He is putting in some long hours trying to learn that, but he's extraordinarily successful early. And I, I was fairly confident because I'd looked at his background and, and really saw that when anyone asked, he was willing to go on and take that, that tough job. And his, his OERs very clearly supported, takes the tough jobs, excels at them. Okay. okay. So as, as you go along, certainly, uh, if you want to be a senior leader, whether it's on the enlisted or the officer side, you want to touch money at some point. You certainly want to uh, understand how to manage uh, people. And when I say that, I don't mean in a leadership role. I'm talking about how do I uh, man formations? How do I go through the, the, the manning process, really? You know, this leads into the next topic, which is from the personal perspective, building that career map. And I know I've heard you talk about it several times before. And I've heard the statement, you know, no one cares more about your career than you do. You know, when should someone look at start building a career map and like, what should that consist of? Okay. So, and I, I so the, the phrase you just used, uh, no one cares more about your career than you do. If that is true uh, in your particular situation, and I don't mean you, but as we're talking to the audience, then I feel for you. Uh, it, it should be your leader's priority as well. And if everyone follows that, and if you make your soldiers' careers a priority, again, very rewarding. Uh, 
The other thing, and I, I want to address this, this is very important. I, I've often heard coming up through my career from, from other people, uh, basically, outside my little, my little bubble, if you will, uh, you're in charge of your own career. Right? You're gonna, you, you, make, you make those decisions. If that were true, right now I would be the chief of staff of the Army. So it is clearly not true that I, I get to make all the decisions about my career. Uh, and I think, again, so I think that's important. As you build out this career map, it's an, it's an ongoing iterative, iterative process that continues and has to have involvement from your leadership. And so as a leader, mm -hmm. if you're not involved in that and helping shape your soldiers and really being involved. So as an example, you and I have talked before, uh, I know what your ambitions are. It's about helping you to get into the position so that ultimately you have a chance to compete for those jobs that you're really looking forward 10 and 12, 14 years down the road. Because when we talk about, as an example, five, six years from now, that's two assignments away. You know, so you're, you're, you're going to, I know you're uh, looking to pin on captain soon. So in six years, you know, you're, you're looking at, Hey, I, I would like to be an S3 or I, perhaps I, I want to be a, uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever that role may be. We essentially have two jobs to get you positioned for that. And I say we, because I really believe again, that this is a team sport. So as you're, as you're building out that career map, I would highly, highly encourage you to, again, touch base with your mentors, mm -hmm. get with your leadership, involve them in, in your career. And again, so I've, I've always been successful uh, with those engagements. I, I have it early and I sit down, I show my career map to my boss and I say, sir, this is where I would like to get to someday. And sometimes they say, Leland, you're, you're not going to get there. Uh, you know, not at least at this point in your career. And this is why. And this is how we shape you. And this is how we get you so that you can have that. So I think, I think the career map is invaluable. And then I, I strongly suggest you update it every year. It's, it's a constant look. And then I think a lot of people, when they talk career map, they, they leave a few things off maybe that they should put on there. Sir, that kind of goes right into my next question. I know I've heard you talk a little bit about like putting some civilian education, some things with your family on your career map. What are some of those things that you would recommend to our listeners today? Yeah. So, uh, again, I had a battalion commander, uh, gosh, right. I'd say maybe year 2000, 2001. And he really helped me understand what my career map should look like, uh, really talked about it. So the first thing he said was, let's start at 20 years. Uh, where do you want to be in 20 years? And at the time I laughed and said, sir, 20 years, I'm worried about getting the next promotion. So he, he really advised me, Hey, if you want to get somewhere, particularly in the service, you're talking about, so you've got a year of school here. So you've got ILE, you've got CGSC, you know, you want to do a two year command. You've got to do KD time as a major. Those are assignments that you have to have. Mm -hmm. So when you look 20 years out, your ability to kind of influence and impact and get those jobs that give you the opportunities to compete 20 years down the road are, are fairly limited. You're only going to have a few blocks. I'm going to go be a battalion three somewhere or an XO. Hopefully you get a chance. Uh, I was blessed to be a battalion commander. That's two years and then a year at senior service college. So that, that 20 year target really starts to shrink down and you probably have about four or five years in there that you can really strongly influence to get to where you want to go. So I, I would start with that. The other thing that is super important to me, it's about family. So when are your kids hitting high school? You know, we talk about high school stabilization a lot, you know, going into your junior year. Mm -hmm. That's something that, you know, circumstances aside, you probably have an idea when your child is born, when they're going to hit 18 years of age, <laughs> right? So <clears throat> you can start planning out uh, where you want your family uh, to be in time and space, uh, location, those high watermarks. I, I, I feel like when your kid is entering high school, is a, it's a big time, right? So kind of plan that out. Hey, maybe I want to try to influence and get moved a year early so that my child can go to eighth grade at middle school and then go to high school so that he knows some of those kids already. And it's not a double whammy of you're making that transition to high school and you don't know anyone. 
Yeah. And so those are things that I think you factor in, you add those in, add your civilian education. If your spouse or your significant other is looking at something, you know, hey, uh, I want to go be a nurse practitioner. Well, that that's that's a couple of years of effort that has to be at the same location. And so when you start programming those uh, opportunities in, I think what, what at least what I have found is 20 years, really you start to get the shakes and go, oh my gosh, I, I got to start moving on it now. And there's some truth to that, hmm. right? Don't, which then leads you to the next thing, right? And And we've talked about this before. When you look at that career map, that will lead you to understand why you shouldn't wait to take opportunities, get your PME done early. That's going to start shaping and you're going to see, hey, if I don't get it done early, I may miss this this very narrow window in a couple of years and this opportunity that could come up. This kind of goes to my next question a little bit, which was like about you, know, you have the you get your packet up for review for like job applications or next positions or promotions. You've sat on a lot of boards what are some of those things in soldiers' packets that, that make them stand out? I love this question. So boards. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's performance. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, there's more to it. But the things that you can control, you can control what your soldier, uh, your ORB, your ERB, uh, your record brief, you can control that. And if, if for some reason there's errors on it, then the board wants to know that you know that, that you're making an effort, right? Write a letter to the board. I, I think in the old days, there was concern, hey, I'm going to point out an error. I promise you, after you look at a thousand uh, ORBs in two days, I don't have to look very hard to see that there's an error. It just looks different. It looks different than everyone else's. And it, it just grabs your attention. And now I want to know, did you know this? And what are you doing to fix it? And if you've written a letter to the board and it says, hey, uh, I acknowledge, you know, as we're transitioning to IPSA, there were some challenges getting, that's fine. At least I know you know, right? And then as far as the board members are concerned, again, things that you can control, your, your name badge uh, being on correctly, that's you. That is not somebody else. You knowing how many uh, Army Achievement Awards that you have and having your ORB or your ERB and your DA photo match, that's 100% on you. That's nobody else. And then it really comes down to what, what does your story say? And, and again, so you've heard me uh, share this uh, just uh, over time, but what narrative, what story are you telling the board? When, you're, when your packet, understand, first of all, boards are composed of human beings. They want to know what the narrative is. Mm -hmm. They're going to make some assumptions. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to look at a letter to the board if you've written one. They're going to look at your ORB. They're going to look at your DA photo. I think people get confused. Well, they're looking to see if I look like I can run. I could not care less about that stuff. What I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to look simple things. The things that you can control are the first things I'm going to look at. Do you pay attention to detail? Okay, now... No challenges, no, there's no discrepancies between your ERB and your DA photo. Okay, the narrative now, the first chapter is, I, I have a soldier who pays attention to detail and does things correctly. Okay, now I'm gonna go to your evaluations. What is that narrative gonna start telling me? And as long as it matches the narrative that started, that we started with, I'm gonna get to the end of the book, so to speak, your book, your career book, uh, and then I'm going to make a determination on where you're scoring. But really, it's about your performance. So all that stuff. And then I'm going to look and say, does the narrative match uh, across the board? And again, typically, it's not 100%, but typically, people who are the highest performers based on their evaluations are also the people who tend to get their uniform <laughs> and all the other stuff right. That's just that's just hard facts that... Uh, the people who take pride in what they do typically take pride in what they do in everything they do. Talking about evaluations a little bit, you know, I've heard that you know the word specific wording matters on NCOERs, OERs. Can you give specific advice to soldiers who are you know writing those support forms as far as uh, wording or language that can be reflected by those you know Raider and Senior Raider comments later? Yeah, so words matter again. So you have to consider that when someone's sitting at a board, they're reading 
not just your last five or seven or 12 or 20 uh, evaluations. They're reading thousands of them, thousands. And so this is important both for the soldier as well as the person doing the rating, the rater and the senior rater. Words matter. So if, if what you write looks the same for everybody, then they're all going to be close in. And that's fine. But now you're, you're asking people who don't know Josh Carr mm -hmm. to make an evaluation when on paper he looks the same as everybody else. Uh, that, that's kind of risky. So words matter. So the things that you, you know, of course, want to talk about, at least on the uh, officer evaluation, uh, you know, enumeration. So enumeration, am I number one of 12? That's different than top 10%. But top 10% could also mean, in that case, maybe he's number two. You know, top half is also true of number one of, of 12, right? Yeah. And so I know it, it, sounds, it sounds crazy to say, but when, again, when you start reading OERs and, and you see something that says, uh, pretty good officer, are you trying to tell me something? Pretty good officer? or excellent officer whose performance, right? So you, you start to, you start to look and, and it's the same thing on your uh, NCOERs, right? Words matter, did a good job. Okay, that's the expectation. Did he do a great job? Can you tell me specifically why he did a great job? Then you look at, you know, promotion potential, should promote now. Okay, we should, but do we have to, right? Again, uh, words matter because you're reading thousands of these pages and some of them stay, you will see one or two soldiers and you're, you just say, wow, I don't know who this is, but I want them to work for me. Those are the easy ones. There are also some pretty easy ones too that are in the opposite direction. We won't uh, focus on them. It's the ones, are you, are you in the, are you in that 25th percentile or are you in the 45th percentile? And a lot of times those uh, evaluations start to look the same. So strongly encourage raters and senior raters to really think through what they're putting, you know, and so I, I started to mention, so I'll just go through them real quick, enumeration, promotion potential, command potential, and uh, schooling, right? So resident, to me, if I, even on a promotion board, if I see someone consistently writes, we need to send this, we need to invest our time and energy by sending him to a resident course, a lengthy resident course, that resonates. So what are your thoughts on confronting a senior rater or senior rater if you feel like your performance is not accurately reflected on that OER? Yeah, so I, I think that's a phenomenal question. I'm going to tell you why. So words matter. Uh, I don't know that confronting would be the approach that I would take because if you are confronting your senior rater about something, what do you think the odds are that that is going to get that person to change their mind and say, you know what? Now that he's yelled at me and told me how, how messed up I am and how I'm stupid, I should definitely change uh, his uh, senior rating and say number one of. That's, that's just, uh, it's not realistic. Mm -hmm. But I do think uh, what you talk about is uh, legitimate, it's a legitimate question and a concern that we often have. So the first thing I would tell you is I've been in that situation where I'll get my uh, evaluation and I'll, I'll read it and I'll say, well, I don't feel like it matches what I've done over the last year. Okay. So I set up an appointment. I don't sign it. Uh, that, that is important because I think if you sign it and then it gets sent off to DA and then you go and ask, Hey, can you change it? You're asking, I mean, that's a lot of work. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know that I would take that approach. So what I've typically done is, uh, you know, I'll ask for uh, an opportunity to sit down and talk and I'll, I'll prepare my thoughts and I'll think back over the year. Now, if I've had, now in my case, I try to have those engagements. I'll ask for counseling. Uh, I'll ask for mentorship, even if it's just during the course of a conversation. Hey, sir, can I get 30 seconds with you afterwards? How am I doing? Did you like the product? So over the course of the year, I've had enough engagements to kind of sense where mm -hmm. I think he's going to rate me. And then in those uh, one or two times over my career where it didn't kind of match, I went in and I discussed it uh, with my senior rater. And I will tell you, uh, each time it's, it's been, hey, you know, I, I wasn't thinking about it or I was kind of in a, you know, I was in a rush. I had other things mm -hmm. going on. I wanted to get this done. Yeah, absolutely. Or I'll just ask and, and say, hey, sir, 
because again, I'm talking about a narrative of, of my career. So I may go in and say, uh, sir, can you, can you modify the language or can we maybe address you? You told me that I was really strong in this area. The areas that you address have been addressed the last five OERs. I, I don't want them thinking I'm a, I'm a, a one trick pony, so to speak. Can you help me out? Again, very successful uh, in that dialogue. And then I would encourage, again, as you well know, as a senior rater and a rater, don't, don't be fearful of having that dialogue and discussion. They're not changing your mind. If they're changing your mind, you probably need to look at, at how you're doing business. But if you're talking about, hey, I want to make sure that the board has a whole picture, you know, a really good picture of who you are as a soldier, I think that's a fair discussion to have with people. One of my all-time favorite discussions uh, with a soldier, he waited. I think I, I had uh, rated him uh, as a senior rater. I, I had given him number three of like 28 or, or 30 uh, majors. <clears throat> a few months down the road, he, he took the opportunity and said, hey, sir, I'm just kind of curious, number three. <laughs> and, and so we had a lengthy dialogue and... Uh, by the time we were done, his position was, wow, I'm glad you, you saw me as number three. And, uh, and he walked out of there feeling like, I know what it takes to improve, not, not to be competitive and try to be number one, but just how to improve as a soldier. It, it just was a really good discussion because here was a guy that I, I literally thought was one of our absolute best, a brand new major with less than, you know, just a few months time in grade when his annual comes up. And uh, I thought, I thought he understood how, how awesome that that OER was. Turns out that that he really didn't understand why he wasn't number. He saw himself as number one, but it was a great dialogue. And uh, when it was over, a he really understood where you know where he could continue to improve. I understood how to communicate better with that particular soldier in the future, and then. Uh, Really, three, I looked back and thought, you know, I, I, I probably didn't do as good a job communicating when I did the closeout uh, counseling as, as I thought I did. Shifting gears a little bit, you mentioned professional military education earlier and getting that PME done early. I'm sure as chief of training, you have some unique perspectives on that. What are your thoughts on PME and when you should accomplish it? And what is your advice to soldiers? Yeah, PME. Okay, uh, so first of all, don't wait. It's like anything else. When the door opens, if you're not qualified, telling somebody, oh, wait, let give me nine weeks so that I can get scheduled, attend, graduate, hold this opportunity of a lifetime for me. Just all I need is nine or 10 weeks. That's not happening. Mm -hmm. It's never going to happen. So if you wait, you are going to miss out on opportunities. Go early. The other, I think, fundamental misunderstanding about professional military education, it's designed for you to have that done before you move on to the next level. In other words, ILE is not designed for you to finish with AOC when you are a senior lieutenant colonel. That, that, and I know you, you know, I get it, circumstances, you know, happen. We're not looking for people to do BLC after they've been an NCO for three and a half years so that they can go on and, and become a staff sergeant. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are processes and programs that kind of prevent that. But, but I really think PME is, if it's not a priority in your organization, you're disadvantaging your soldiers. And if it's not a priority as a soldier, you're disadvantaging yourself. Somebody's going to have that done. And how many times, if we are honest with ourselves, how many times in our careers have we looked back and said, the only reason that guy got that job was because he did X. Okay, well, X was a prerequisite for that job and you didn't get it done. And it's, I know I, I get pretty passionate about PME because right now we have some challenges with no shows and we have challenges with, you know, why should I go do this? I wanna be a platoon leader. I don't wanna go to captain's career course. All valid stuff, but at the end of the day, do you also want to be a company commander? Because that might be inside of your organization, a prerequisite to be a company commander, to be captain's career course qualified. And you never know, particularly in the Army National Guard, when someone's civilian career is going to require them to up and move. 
And if they move across the country and now all of a sudden that, uh, that position that you really wanted to have comes open, what are the odds your battalion and brigade commander are going to be okay with waiting until next summer when you can get that seat for you to be done? It's challenging. So speaking of that, let's say I just completed my um, PME, you know, for the next grade or for my current grade, and I have a few years before I'm eligible for that next set of PME. What's your recommendations on education or training courses that soldiers can do in that in-between time? Yeah, great question. So I think uh, so I think you can get after some of your civilian ed, right? So that might be a good time to start working part time on a master's degree, uh, which is good for both your civilian and your military career. I think you can. Uh, so uh, we put out every year a uh, strategic broadening opportunities uh, program, basically a catalog of a lot of different opportunities. So we have opportunities for people to go again. I, I briefly mentioned the UK send people over, I think it's two, two and a half weeks, a broadening seminar uh, in, uh, with our international partners. There are uh, things like uh, the national security uh, course, different opportunities, and it, it changes year to year. So I would strongly encourage uh, your listeners to ask their chain of command or, or go out and Google and find uh, the, the strategic broadening opportunities. Again, it's a catalog, it changes uh, because the Army is always searching for, hey, what, what do we need to help develop? What are those things that we can put together? It is a list. I can't even think of uh, you know, a lot of specifics right now. I just keep coming back to the, to the international opportunities for a couple of weeks. Uh, but there's stuff here in the States, there's stuff here in DC. Uh, we, uh, obviously, we have the strategic uh, leader uh, seminar here in TR. There's just so much stuff that I think the challenge isn't what do I do? I think it's how do I find out about it? Mm -hmm. What are those opportunities? Yeah. How do I know? Because despite the fact that we live in the, the, the tech, technology age or age, yeah. of, age of computing, there's just so much information. How do I, so, so I would encourage people, you can go to GKO, you can go to this website, uh, you know, the leader development uh, here in uh, the training division. But ask your leadership, because really what we want to get is that education from top to bottom, from the, the, the adjutant general all the way down to our newest company commander, platoon leader, to be able to offer those opportunities and hang it up uh, in the armory and say, hey, here's something that's coming up. The SLS, uh, gosh, Josh, help me out. I mean, there's, oh, there's, yeah, a, no, there's no. a gazillion things that we have going on. And quite frankly, a lot of them we pay for. They're centrally funded. So... So go to the website uh, and just and just kind of stay abreast. Look at the opportunities. Uh, you can do uh, ADOS opportunities. And ADOS opportunities don't have to be for a year at a time either. And so there's opportunities. We have the High Performing Leader Program, which is up to a year where we'll PCS on. But it's also a few months at a time. Hey, I just want to go and have this assignment at, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, AMC or TRADOC. I want to go understand the TRADOC. Uh, perspective or force com or hey can i go to the 101st any number of things and we'll work with you in your state to help figure out how do we broaden you and how do we offer those opportunities kind of talking a little bit you mentioned a little bit about getting that civilian education what are some of your thoughts on that you know i mean I, for guardsmen especially but uh on getting civilian education over the course of your career both as an officer but as a mco as well when i was working in the civilian sector uh and i would uh, look at who am I going to hire for positions? It's not just about what's their highest level of education. It's about, are they a learner or not? Mm -hmm. And so both in the military and in the civilian career uh, that, that you're going to have, you want to demonstrate to people that you're naturally curious, that you are able to learn, that you're able to, to take in new information, that you're not going to be the same person that you, you've always been. And so I think that education is, is critical, again, not just for uh, your military career, but really for your civilian occupation. You know, a lot of professional uh, careers, you know, lawyers, doctors, nurses, they have requirements, continuing education. So mm -hmm. it's actually a fundamental requirement in order to continue in that profession. You have to go and take more training and education. And I will tell you that in any, any field, uh, and again, same thing in the military when we're sitting on a board. Okay, so so it's been 14 years since you you got a, you know any kind of education. 
why would I select you to go to the Harvard program if I don't know how well you're going to do, but then there's going to be someone who's just shown a natural inclination. Hey, I'm curious. I want to learn. Uh, I'm trainable. I think it's critical and it's not just for your uh, military career, but it's really about your civilian occupation as well. And, and so I would strongly encourage you again, uh, you know, it's, it, there's so many opportunities in the guard that we don't uh, collectively often take uh, advantage of enough. So we have opportunities, you know, the new cool, I forget what it stands for. That's not my program, but the army will pay thousands of dollars a year for you to go oh, get yeah. certifications. And there's hundreds and hundreds of these different things. It may be, you know, you're a skydiving uh, instructor. That's what you do. And you want to get a different, you know, certification, a different level. The army will pay for some of that. The army may pay for the whole thing. We have tuition assistance. We have the GI bill. If you're not getting an education, Again, it may be, hey, I want to go transition to be an HVAC uh, repairman. I want to go learn a new level of whatever. Take advantage of the opportunity. Gosh, uh, the Army will pay for a lot of it. And your civilian career will benefit as well. So it's not just about how do I make it from E6 to E7. It may be how do I go from you know one position to being the supervising manager or crew manager or whatever. You know, that extra two or three or four dollars an hour, you know, whatever helps your family along the way. So we ask this of all the guests on the program, and that is if you could give one piece of advice to those young leaders coming up through the ranks, what would it be? Mm, one piece. All right. So a lesson that I learned a long time ago uh, that I would share. The Army is an inanimate thing. And uh, please stay with me through this whole thing because I don't want to. I love the Army. I love the Army National Guard. I love what I do. Gosh, I love this organization. This organization as a thing does not love you back. And, and, and that's important because it's kind of like uh, a Harley Davidson, right? A lot of people love their motorcycle. I love my Harley. That Harley does not care who puts the gas, the oil in it, air in the tires, does not care. Just needs it to continue to move. The army is very similar. Now, having said that, so as a soldier, you have to understand that if you're waiting on the army or the army guard to do everything for you, you're going to be disappointed and probably going to become disgruntled. So, so don't wait on the army to do it for you. You have to be engaged. You have to take charge. You have to, to be involved now and more critical as a leader. Don't wait for the army to take care of your soldiers. That's your job, leader. That's your job. The army isn't going to do it for you because the army is an inanimate object. All right. Just needs the air, the oil and the gas and it will keep moving. Your job as a leader is to make sure that when your soldiers have issues, when they have concerns, when there's opportunities, Leaders have to be engaged. Don't wait on other people. Don't assume that that soldier's pay is going to get fixed. You, squad leader, you, company commander, go get involved. Make sure stuff. So, so that, it kind of changed my perspective. A long time ago when I was a young soldier, I was waiting. And sometimes you just wait on, you know, why doesn't the Army fix this for me? And then you get, you get kind of a little unhappy and, you know, I was going to say something else. But you get on, you become unhappy and, and you say, the Army. It did. It wasn't the army that did it. It, it. it just, it wasn't. The army can't do anything to you. Caring or uncaring leaders, that is what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. Caring and uncaring. So be a caring leader, be involved. It's just really not that hard to pick up the phone and say, Hey, get this soldier's pay fixed. Hey, why, why is this soldier not able uh, to take leave when they're, when their wife is on the other side of the country and getting ready to have a baby. Like, what's the big deal? I, I, a lot of times it's simply because the army doesn't know that that's a situation. Mm -hmm. Leaders can make that happen. So my, my overarching advice to people coming into the army and, and really those leaders, those E5s, E6s, those captains, those lieutenants, don't wait on the army. It's your job. If you're waiting on somebody else to do it, your soldiers are suffering and they shouldn't. So if you had one resource then, sir, that you would recommend to young soldiers looking to do self-development, what would it be? Go talk to a senior NCO who's been around for a while. And that goes for officers and uh, soldiers. 
And I say that because that resource has so much information and really has so much experience. Go find that E7, that E8, who's been around the block a couple of times because everything's going to change. If I give you a website today, it's going to be different next year. If I tell you, hey, we've got this program, it's going to modify and maybe it's available, maybe it's not. Things change. Those conditions change. Experience that that ability to tap into that our most valuable resource, which is our soldiers to, you know, quite frankly, go find someone who recently retired. By the way, don't tap into the disgruntled soldier, right? Uh, that that person who who kind of had a bad experience. I'm not talking about the E4 barracks lawyer who, you know, oh, this is, uh, everything's messed up. Avoid that person. Uh, he's not going to give you good insights and advice. It might not be everyone's putting it on him. So when, when you ask about that resource, I would tell you those senior NCOs, uh, retirees, and I've got a whole, uh, sometimes whether I like it or not, I got a whole group of sergeant majors that are retired that are very happy to give me input. And I, and I say that invaluable, those experiences, I tap into those all the time. Hey, mm -hmm. I think it's unique, my experience with, with the situation. I tap into those guys or girls and I'm telling you, they can, they can walk you through what they did and their, their experiences can inform you. It may be a little bit different, but, but you know, soldiers are soldiers. You, you have resources. You just got to develop those relationships and, and really tap in early. Well, sir, thank you so much for sharing your advice and experience uh, with us today here. I really appreciate you having me. Uh, this has been a fantastic experience. And so what I would encourage and ask all of, uh, all of our listeners is please, if you've got ideas for things that interest you, topics that you would like to hear about, please, please send those to us. Uh, we want to make sure that we're producing content that you find value uh, in and, and that you're able to uh, re use as a resource for you and your soldiers. So please let us know what we can do for you. And uh, again, really appreciate you uh, having me on today. Tune in to Leaders Recon over the next few weeks as we bring in today's leaders and pioneers to discuss their experiences, share their wisdom, and help you grow as a leader. We will also be announcing opportunities for you to sharpen your skills as a leader in today's Army National Guard. See you next time. If you liked today's episode, don't forget to subscribe below and leave us a five-star review. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.